I want to begin uh, by making uh, three big points. The first is, and you may think that these are so familiar that they don't need restating, but I'm going to do so anyway. Uh, the future of the U.S.-China relationship is going to have a major impact on the shape of the globe's political, economic, cultural uh, developments uh, in the next uh, decades. It isn't like uh, the Cold War, and I myself uh, reject almost all of the uh, similarities uh, that uh, some develop. Uh, I think uh, the U.S.-China relationship is so different than the U.S.-Soviet relationship that we should forget any analogizing, any analogizing. And I can develop why I think that's true. So uh, this is a bilateral relationship that dwarfs every other bilateral relationship in the world. This is a watermelon and the rest are walnuts, if you like pictorial uh, examples. That's the first point. The second is that it will be impossible to stabilize world order in a situation in which there's permanent confrontation between the United States and China. Impossible. And everybody's lives in the United States, China, and in most places in the world are going to get worse over time in the context of a U.S.-China permanent confrontation. These stakes are enormous, therefore, and we often talk about them, this bilateral relationship, if it's just another important problem for the United States. It is not just another important problem. It is the important problem for the United States. So that's number two. And number three, uh, what I tried to do in these policy prescriptions is take us down, uh, in many instances, from 30,000 feet theorizing to imagine uh, what a uh, new administration might develop as a grand strategy blueprint for China, U.S. policy toward China. So think of a hub and spokes, the hub being the U.S.-China relationship and U.S. policy toward China, and 22 policy prescriptions, which I'll go over uh, yeah, very briefly, at least some of them, depending on the time. So what's the problem in the relationship in my judgment now? And in my judgment, it is that both the United States and China are striving for primacy in Asia at the other's expense. They both deny it. They both deny it explicitly in what the official documents of the governments um, uh, say, but I don't believe it. In China's case, and I developed this in the report at some length, in China's case, I think their behavior makes clear their international behavior that they are trying to supplant the United States in the, uh, uh, in the Asian region. Uh, and in the U.S. case, I think our muscle memory and instincts still seek the primacy we had for 40 years. And whatever we say, we act as if largely we still want it. So two uh, major powers, uh, one rising seeking to change the rules of the game, the other the status quo power trying to maintain the same rules of the game obviously are uh, in, uh, in serious uh, structural competition. Um, I think that uh, in, in addressing this, in addressing this, uh, 
In olden days, the instinct would have been diplomacy. How do you deal with two nations with these fundamental disagreements on not only their external policies, but how societies should be uh, organized and how their politics should be carried out, but with diplomacy. And one of the reasons the relationship is getting worse is because uh, there is very little diplomacy going on between the two countries except in the trade area. And, and uh, if you were data-driven, you would just ask yourself, how many times have the leaders met? How many times have the foreign ministers met? How many times have the uh, de defense ministers met? It's very small numbers. And it is a curiosity, isn't it? Uh, and one that I don't have the answer to, that in a situation in which the bilateral relationship is deteriorating, and everybody says it is, and and uh, 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 that point was made just a moment ago, that the two countries are doing so little about it. Why? And perhaps you will tell me uh, why. Now, uh, I don't think, at least in the next decade, either country can succeed in uh, gaining primacy. And uh, I'm skeptical that will happen even in the decades beyond that. But, uh, uh, if the two of them keep trying, the relationship is going to get worse and worse. Now, how does the United States persuade, influence, coerce China, and I use, uh, I use that word explicitly, coerce China, countries do coerce other countries, uh, uh, how does it conduct itself in a way in which it gives China more incentives to act in a responsible way, at least in the U.S. view of what that would mean. And the report has many prescriptions which try to address that, uh, including uh, greater power projection into A Asia by the United States. Uh, in uh, the diplomatic realm, in the economic and trade realm, uh, in uh, the military uh, sector. Uh, so uh, I believe that if the U.S. were to do that, were to do that, uh, then we would see uh, China as a great power. Uh, I think I'm, I have to now start training myself to stop saying rising great power. I think I should just say great power. I, uh, that was an epiphany I just had, so i uh, glad I'm here. Um, so let me just get, and I'm just going to do these uh, very, very quickly. Uh, what are the policy prescriptions? These are the 22 spokes. Now the first, and I'll just uh, go through them, uh, is to mobilize all of its instruments of national power, economic, infrastructure, immigration, entitlement spending, all of that. Now you may say, find it odd that I start there, but of course if the United States is to compete with China over the long run, the uh, uh, functioning of the U.S. government and society will be a crucial factor. The more it's divided, the weaker we are in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 interacting on the global scene and affecting uh, Chinese behavior. So I start with our domestic situation, and of course uh, we all worry about that. And of all my policy prescriptions, this is one where the reaction to the report has been most hopeless in thinking we can actually do anything about that, but I'm not hopeless. The second is to protect the integrity of our domestic democratic institutions, which are now in the uh, news every day and in jeopardy in my judgment. Third, we need to educate the American people
to the nature and duration of China's challenge to U.S. national interests and democratic values, but not with rhetoric that uh, repeats a red scare that we've had in our history. But it is remarkable how little the United States, uh, if this administration and its predecessors, ta have talked to the American people about the China challenge in a reasonable and moderate and thoughtful way. So that's my number three. Four, uh, a successful U.S.-China policy cannot be carried out without a collaborative relationship between the, United St between the executive branch and the congressional branch. Again, this may be number two in hopelessness, uh, but uh, it's necessary, and this is developed at length in the report. Let me say just this about uh, the Congress in China, and uh, some of you will find it perhaps overly provocative. Uh, what I am uh, concerned about is uh, the fact that both parties in the Congress now, each trying to outdo the other in their condemnation of China. Now, as you'll see in the report, if you look at it, I am uh, very uh, tough on what I regard as Chinese misbehavior and strategic goals that, uh, that uh, seek to weaken the United States. But only giving bills of indictment with no policy prescriptions to try to remedy the current situation seems quite um, irresponsible. And the Democrats seem to me to have caught this disease of a uh, one-sided approach uh, to trying to uh, deal with China. Uh, so, uh, uh, and if you look at the, look at the debates uh, and what these candidates say about China, uh, have you heard uh, the current uh, folks in the debate say, but we have to intensify our diplomacy to try to reach some sort of equilibrium with China over the long term? No. No. Haven't heard that, have you? Six, uh, we uh, need to develop a national uh, initiative on AI technologies, uh, and uh, that is developed. This should be the scale of the Manhattan Project, not uh, organized like the Manhattan Project, but the scale of the Manhattan Project. Uh, seventh, I'm picking up speed. Uh, the U.S. should not be diverted from the China challenge by regional problems around the globe. Uh, the, the most precious resource of any uh, policymaker anywhere in the world is the time they have every day to work on problems and challenges. And uh, our policymakers spend far much too much time working on problems uh, in the Middle East and lesser in Europe and not on the China challenge. Uh, I say in the report that in the White House Situation Room where I've spent years of my life, there should be a, a very large sign on the wall that says, Think China, because China uh, is a factor in uh, most dimensions of American foreign policy. And let me give you a vivid example. So a month ago, or maybe now six weeks ago, the United States and Iran walked up to the possibility of a major conflict. Right? And uh, happily, they stepped back. Happily, they stepped back. But if you're concerned about the rise of Chinese power at the expense of the United States in Asia, what would you think about the United States triggering a major war with Iran and imagine what effect that would have on uh, our capacity to deal with China? Nine is uh, the U.S. should su substantially strengthen its military power projection into Asia. Ten is to uh, insist on str strict reciprocity 
in every dimension of the U.S.-China relationship. And as those of you who follow this know, that has not been the case uh, in uh, the past uh, two and a half decades. So that's 10. 11, uh, the United States should recognize that public rebukes or private entreaties are not going to change China's domestic, political, economic, and societal policies and practices. We are not going to change the way China chooses to run itself. And uh, in that regard, uh, I'm uh, especially worried about the increase in articles in the U.S academic literature, strategic literature, which say that the United States can only have a good relationship over the long term if there's regime change in China. I think that is highly dangerous and those kinds of articles are multiplying. Twelve Hong Kong, the Hong Kong crisis, and you know this who follow it. First of all, it dominated the outcome of the Taiwan presidential election. <laughs> but more than that, I think it destroyed, or is in the process of destroying, the notion of uh, uh, one state, two systems. And of course, the Taiwan uh, issue has been based on that. We should respond, 13, to Chinese cyber attacks with economic sanctions and proportionate offensive cyber operations against China. 14, we should ramp up our efforts to counter Beijing's influence operations in the United States. 15, no G2. The U.S. Uh, depends on its allies to balance the rise of Chinese power. Sixteen, we should work with our partners in Asia for a more, more robust economic uh, presence. Uh, that, uh, that's, uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the domain of perhaps one of the worst decisions uh, and there are competitors that President Trump made in taking office, which was to withdraw from the TPP. Seventeen, uh, we need to intensify our diplomacy with, region, with nations across uh, uh, the region on, on issues that are central to the future of America. Climate, free trade, international security, and so forth. Eighteen, this is one of the more controversial points. I think, uh, and I could quote Spig Brzezinski here, I do in the report, who says the worst possible outcome is a strategic alliance, for the United States, is a strategic alliance between uh, China and Russia. That's happening. It's on its way. And uh, so far, our diplomacy with Russia have, has accelerated that. So I make some recommendations about what to do in the U.S.-Russia relations. 19, we need a U.S.-China and South Korea, Japan, Russia initiative, but in the first instance a U.S.-China initiative on North Korean nuclear weapons. The uh, position now of the American administration is a fantasy that it can somehow persuade North Korea to give up all of its nuclear weapons at once. Of course it can't. We know that there will be no agreement between the United States and uh, North Korea without Chinese support. So, and again, what I was saying earlier, uh, where is the major effort between the, uh, uh, on the part of the United States to seek counsel with China uh, and uh, uh, reach an agreement about the best way to approach uh, North Korea? Instead, we have been subjected to a uh, summit reality show, as you know, and not serious diplomacy. We need an interim agreement that freezes their production of nuclear weapons and uh, ballistic missile development. 21, climate, that's uh, clear to all of us, can't have a, a, a successful climate regime uh, without the United States and China. 22, uh, 
the the lack of diplomacy between uh, the two countries is I said earlier is deeply disturbing to me and uh, I don't know to conclude uh, I don't know if it's possible for either side now to exercise uh, diplomatic initiatives one can be very pessimistic about that but if they don't the situa the, the bilateral relationship and therefore uh, global stability will be more and more threatened. Thank you, Steve. Terrific summary. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, what I found so interesting about the 22 prescriptions and the analysis, the brief analysis that, that, that preceded it, is on the analysis side, there was a lot of your analysis that I don't agree with. Um, however, when you got to the prescriptions, even if you agree with me, the prescriptions are pretty good. You know, intense diplomacy, rejoining, uh, rejoining the, the Paris Agreement, uh, this whole host of things, you kind of go, sure, we should do that. That makes, that makes great sense. I think the only, in the prescriptions, we'll, we'll get to the analysis first, in the prescriptions, I guess, you know, I think of President Clinton, you know, when, during the campaign, he had everybody, you know, it's the economy, stupid, you know, just talk about the economy. And you're kind of using that and saying, you know, we should at every NSC, State Department, Defense Department, Treasury and Commerce desk, we should say, it's China, stupid. Think about China. But the way I would think about China, because I have a different analysis, is think about the areas of cooperation. So if you're, th if you're at defense, Rather than thinking about the areas of confrontation, think about humanitarian assistance, think about search and rescue, think about areas of, of where we can work with them on North Korea. Think Steve, about it. it has to be both. It has to be both. Because you're not going to persuade, nor would I support, the Pentagon not thinking about contingencies which could bring the United States and China's military forces into conflict any more than you would expect the PLA not to have, be preoccupied with that possibility. But we have to do the other as well, and they have to both be done at the same time. And that's been but beyond then, either government so far. That was leading, though, to my first question, which was, the, what did you think, in the context of this now, what did you think of the national security strategy put out in December of 2017, and then the, 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 the uh, defense strategy put out about a month later in, in the way you're thinking about these prescriptions, you know, kind of characterizing China in such a pejorative way and talking about a revisionist power and a strategic competition. Is that a good way to go? Or? Yes, I think. I do believe China is a revisionist power and a strategic competitor of the United States. The, so much of the, of the uh, what national... What does revisionist power mean? I never quite understood It wants it to meant. change the rules of the game. It wants to, and again, uh, I'm, I'm not I'm making a that. moral judgment here about China. It's acting the way big powers act. The rules were uh, uh, created without its contribution. So it th comes as no surprise. But what I think about, so the national, I think some of it was overly rhetorical for me, for sure, but its basic core message I agreed with. However, uh, the, the uh, report ended uh, before it got around to uh, discussing how we might find areas of cooperation with mm -hmm. China. And that is an inexcusable uh, omission. It's, it's not enough to simply have a bill of indictment and to be, I think, a responsible government, and I must say the same thing is true in China, but it, to have a responsible government, it needs to do both. It needs to take steps which it regards as necessary with respect to its interests and values, but at the same time, uh, George Schultz, or Henry Kissinger, or Jim Baker, if I may say, uh, three of my heroes, um, 
uh, and worked with all three of them, uh, would not stop uh, with the indictment. They would say, well, Schultz was like, what are we going to do about this? Because the de continued deterioration of the U.S.-China relationship is obviously so not in America's interest, what are we going to do about it? But I would argue that some of the deterioration is based upon the rhetoric that emanates from this administration, that it forces the Chinese into what I would call a defensive crouch and not looking for areas of cooperation. I was shocked to find, you know, the WHO has sent a team to, to China. There are no Americans on that team. Yeah, it's, that is one shocking statement about how bad the U.S.-China relationship has become that there are no Americans? They certainly was, when, I, when the initial list went forward, I think there were 12 Americans, if I recall correctly on it, and none got approved to go. That's really a statement. But I think what this rhetoric does is pushes the Chinese away, makes them much more of a competitor, and basically strips the, those in China who support us from being able to speak, strips them of that ability. That what we're doing, what we're doing with these policies is we have no nuance. That China is not a monolith, despite what, what you read and hear. That there are those in China who are incredibly pro-American, pro-constructive engagement, pro-participation in international institutions, and there are those who aren't. And what our policies are doing are we're effectively enabling those who are against. Well, this is, this is obviously a very old argument in American foreign <coughs> policy, uh, and we can find many examples. I have a different view. I don't think that the Chinese leadership says, oh my goodness, all this harsh rhetoric, we better go into a defensive crouch. These are people too serious for that, in my judgment. Uh, but, but, uh, I... Uh, imagine that first meeting between a Schultzian figure and his Chinese counterpart, the American would say, I have an idea just to get started. Why don't we cool the rhetoric in our public statements about each other? The People's Daily is not exactly a crochet uh, uh, <laughs> group when it talks about the United States. But that's something that the two governments could do overnight is start is 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 getting rid of this inflammatory rhetoric uh, uh, but i do think i'm a realist so i think china acts uh uh, uh with uh, uh its national interests uh in mind and not what the americans uh, say about it but this is very old harry hopkins comes back <laughs> from moscow in 1944 and says to fdr well you know there are some voices in our administration that are uh, uh, producing in Stalin a more defensive and antagonistic view than he would otherwise have, right. <laughs> so I just don't pay much attention to that. But the effects, and you were about to say this if you'd had one more minute, th that's quite different from the effects on publics of this rhetoric. Because I don't think it affects governments. I don't think Americans wake up in the morning and say, well, what is in the People's Daily? Are we in a defensive crouch? But Americans hearing this unremitting, uh, one-sided, as I've tried to say, uh, 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 rhetoric about China and the Chinese citizens the same, well, this has an effect over time. Uh, as I say, wait for a leader, and I don't, in the U.S. case, I don't mean necessarily somebody in the administration, to give a speech which has both halves of this, yeah. both has what we must do as a country to successfully compete with China and affect its external behavior, and what we must do diplomatically to try to narrow the differences. Yeah, but I, th I think your po one of your prescriptions is educate the American public, educate the Congress, educate the executive branch, because what we have today is a totally unnuanced view of China. In other words, when you, know, you say China wants to displace America and Asia, I will point you to a lot of quotes and a lot of actions which suggest 
that is not the case. You won't agree with me, but, and I won't use the time, but it's 40 years, 42 years now of dealing with the Chinese leadership. You know what the Chinese leadership, you know, it's one of the national security advisors of, of, of China, who's a good friend, said, you're missing something about China when, when you're criticizing us on these things. He says, you know, this was during the, the, uh, the, the end of the Bush era. He says, President Bush gets up and Bob briefs him on, on Iraq, Afghanistan, Venezuela, Somalia, and that's what, that's the first thing in the morning that the president does. When the president, at this point it was still Hu Jintao, when Hu Jintao gets up in the morning, he gets briefed on Sichuan, Tibet, Xinjiang, Guangzhou. The focus is inward. So when everybody says China wants be, to be number one, when you're a country of 1.4 billion, you're actually worried about how can I deal with this the issues within China. You don't really think that much about being number one. You don't think that much about displacing the United States in Asia or the rest of the world. You think about how I, chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, can maintain power. And to the extent that foreign policy rolls into China. So if we have a challenge to them, so obviously Taiwan, it rolls into China, has tremendous domestic resonance. So the president of China, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, needs to take stands because of the domestic resonance. But a lot of the stuff that goes on in Africa, that goes on in Latin America, you know, the, the, in fact, I would argue the Belt and Road Initiative. It's, you know, they can do it or they could live without it. Well, um, I'm anxious to hear from our colleagues out there, but I just say we have no idea what uh, the Chinese leadership thinks about it in the morning because it's utterly non-transparent. And uh, I don't argue in uh, my report that I know what they think about. So we all speculate, right? We speculate and hopefully our speculation is based on data. What are they actually doing? Not what are they saying, but what are they doing? But I cannot prove that my uh, 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 analysis is accurate. Uh, uh, all I can say is it's, it's my reading of available evidence. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I agree entirely what you said. By the way, I don't think that uh, this admit that this president wakes up in the morning and thinks about Somalia, incidentally. Uh, Does he get a national security briefing first occasionally. thing in the morning? No, not every day. My, my last question, then I'll open it to a, a great audience, which is because of the characters, in other words, Harry Harding many years ago laid out um, kind of what, how we should think about our relationship with China. And he, he put it on three levels. He put it on kind of the basic, the economic level. And we were gonna have economic competition with China, and that's fine. We have economic competition with Canada, with the UK, with our friends, with Mexico. That, that's okay, no problem. We're gonna have diplomatic competition with China, and that means we need to strengthen our diplomacy, what you talk about, you know, strengthen our diplomatic activity throughout the world, at the UN, in other places, because that's going to allow us to compete with China. But the strategic competition, if we enter into the strategic competition, the consequences for budget are so significant that it will weaken America. And that's when we characterize China the way is often done, it leads to a defense budget that now is what, $850 billion? What that could, be, what just a tiny part of that could be used to rebuild our infrastructure, to rebuild our education, to make the investment in AI. But if we continue down this road, there's what the Chinese would say, a maodun. There's a contradiction between the strategic competition and rebuilding America. Well, first of all, uh, unhappily, uh, I've been a Republican all my life, but we now have a Congress where neither party cares about the deficit or the debt. Clearly, neither party. It's just the difference is how they want to borrow more money 
to spend their pet projects and the Democrats tend to want to do it on social issues and uh, the Republicans tend to want to do it on defense issues, but none of them care anymore about uh, fiscal responsibility. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, there should be trade-offs uh, between our domestic and our uh, national security challenges in the first instance. We of course should spend our defense dollars sensibly, but, uh, and that depends on one's analysis of the international threats and opportunities. Uh, and, uh, but that has to be preeminent because uh, our president has a constitutional obligation to protect the country. He clearly doesn't have a, a, cons a constitutional obligation to reduce the debt. <laughs> right. So he has to start protect, uh, the protecting of the country. Um, what I would hope, so I'll finish with this. What I would hope is that those folks who uh, uh, share Steve's uh, analysis of Chinese uh, objectives and those folks who uh, would agree more generally with my objectives can uh, in a civil way come together around what sh we should do because we can never either one of us prove the other is wrong yep. and uh, so what should we do uh, there's a quote at the end of the <laughs> of the uh, report uh, uh, by uh, uh, Leonardo. Leonardo said this, I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. Well, we must do. Very deep thoughts about what's going on in the U.S. China relationship, and Ambassador, to you for all your public service. Uh, in the prescriptions, in the early group of those, you highlight the impact of domestic political issues in the United States on U.S. China relationships, and understanding that it's only your best speculation. What do you think? is the impact of the domestic Chinese concerns that Steve was talking about, particularly the domestic political objectives of the Chinese government on U.S.-China relations. Say the back, the last part again, the effect of... Of the Chinese domestic concerns and policy objectives on U.S.-Chinese policy, Chinese policy toward the United States. Well, since I can find so little Chinese policy on the part of the administration, it's hard for me to uh, answer that. I, on the Chinese side. Well, again, I will now speculate. Sure. But it's on the basis of many talks with Chinese counterparts, some very senior Chinese counterparts. And one always has to be careful with the they would say that, wouldn't they, phenomenon. But I worry, let me put it like that, that the erratic policy by this president and the views of the Congress, which are almost wholly negative now about China, may be introducing into the Chinese leadership for the first time, not that we cannot work with this administration, but that we can't work with America. And that would be an enormous change in Chinese policy. But when they look both at the erratic behavior of this administration and the views of the Congress, that's not a leap to come to that conclusion. Now, I think their national interests will drive them into trying to work with any American government on their terms. On their terms. But just as we all try to work with the Chinese government under a different administration on our terms. But I'm worried about that. One of the things that political scientists often uh, uh, exclude is uh, 
human behavior and the fact that these are actually homo sapiens who are at the top of these governments who are affected by more than just uh, 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 cold, clear, analytical thinking. And uh, can I give you an example, which you then could, this is important because it's so indicative. The signing ceremony of the U.S.-China trade agreement. Get on YouTube and look at it. It's about an hour long and for the first five zero minutes or so it's as if there are no Chinese in the audience. And it is a denunciation of the president's predecessors that they've been weak with China, that they've capitulated to Chinese objectives, that he's the only one who's understood this challenge from China. It goes on and on. It, it is, it will remind you, a domestic political speech of the kind that he gives, but it was given with arguably the second or third most important person in China sitting in the room. Standing. Well, he didn't... He didn't he, offer he, him a chair. He well, stood there yeah, the whole time. It was yeah. horrible. Yeah, but... Uh, 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 and he didn't walk out. But back to my point about our species, uh, and I've seen him since that, uh, since that ceremony. Uh, well, how would, it how would it affect you? And then as he goes back home and talks to first meeting, well, how'd that go? Well, <laughs> here's what happened. So I'm worried that there's this uh, accumulating uh, conviction in China that we, you just can't work with these Americans. Uh, and uh, uh, these are human beings like us who get affected by how we're treated and how things are put and so forth. So, but have a look at that, that if you haven't looked at it. It, it. It'll chill you the way it was done. Fred. Ambassador Black, well, uh, thank you very much. I, since you published this, I've studied it a few times before I come here. Well, that's nice of you. Um, I was attracted by the word grand strategy. Uh, as an American, actually, I am looking for a grand strategy irrespective of the country, irrespective of our political party. Uh, I re read this, I think it's a comprehensive 22 countermeasures rather than grand strategy. So my question is this, in any successful negotiation, it's always what's in it for the other side. What's in it for China with these 22 strategies? Well, uh, I think they're in two categories. The first is what's in it for China is collaborating on issues that have, are concerned to the Chinese leadership, like uh, climate and the North Korean issue and the international economy and so forth. So those are in China's interest, uh, uh, and uh, so that's what's in it for China. On the growth of American power projection, uh, that's the other category. Uh, China won't like it. China won't like it. Uh, whether uh, Steve's analysis is right or mine, uh, in either case, China won't like it. And I think China may find, some of Chinese will find it genuinely threatening. Genuinely threatening. So uh, uh, what's in it for them in the second category is to try to persuade the United States that it's not necessary. That it's not necessary. The problem is that the growth of the Chinese military budget and its power projection uh, out into the second island chain makes it hard to argue that it's not necessary. And that, I, I have a prescription on the South China Sea uh, 
it can't be reversed what China has done uh, in building and militarizing these islands, but uh, it, this is an issue crying out for a bilateral discussion of how, how do we try to ensure that the current status quo uh, is not disrupted by our ships running into one another, for example, or our aircraft or what have you. And, um, uh, and certainly one step China could take is stop militarizing, the, 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 but they not stop, they're going on. And when you have private conversations with Chinese strategists outside the government, inside the government they're pretty disciplined, which is what they're paid to do, but outside the government there is a lot of concern about Xi Jinping's actions in the last five years. Awakening the slumbering giant. Why? Partly because of these enormous domestic challenges that China has. You had a lot of criticism uh, in the Chinese strategic elite. I mean, it's patriotic criticism, but essentially, well, I wouldn't have done it like that. Because look what's happened to the reaction of the Americans uh, in the last five to seven years. So, uh, but uh, the core of your question, by the way, the front half of the, the back half are the prescriptions. I hope the front half has a, a, a grand strategy in it. But the, the core of your question is absolutely right. That each side has to find issues on which it can plausibly reach an agreement with the other side. And if it rules out most issues, well, the relationship is going to get worse. Uh, and if it refuses, here again, Homo sapiens, uh, this is the first administration in which neither side seeks to meet regularly with the other. Neither side. So our Secretary of State flies over China frequently, rarely lands. Well, if this is the most important issue facing the United States, how can that be that our Secretary of State doesn't go? By the way, does the same thing with the Russians. So if our, uh, if our policies are in that regard, we're not likely to open up a, 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 an agreement. And if the Chinese are treated the way they were treated in this trade uh, uh, ceremony, agreement ceremony, is that going to lead to, well, I know what I'd like to do next is go to the United States? Really? So the core is right, but it isn't happening now. And it isn't as if there's a stasis here. There is no stasis. If it's not happening now, it's worse today than it was yesterday. And if it goes on for the rest of this year, uh, then... Uh, and then, if we have this president, I have no reason to believe it will change with this president. I used to be confident that it would change with uh, a Democratic president, even though uh, Bill Clinton called them the butchers of Beijing, I seem to recall. But now, I don't know which of these presidents uh, will stress, or which of these candidates will stress in the period ahead as we go head toward November, something which I regard more sensible toward approaching China. Uh, Nancy's, Nancy Pelosi's uh, uh, comments about China are in fact as bad in many respects as the worst of the administration, not the president, but the worst of the administration's comments about China. One last question up here, lady right there. So, Bob, you've come up with this great list of 22 prescriptions, and I think a lot of us can agree that if we were to implement them, that there would be an improvement in U.S.-China relations. But for a variety of reasons, um, mainly U.S. domestic political concerns, there's no possibility that a lot of these can be implemented in the short term. And 
especially if Trump is reelected and there's a high likelihood of that, then a lot of these prescriptions are, are not going to be put into place. Right? So um, my question is, what's there's the difference between what we should do and what we can do, and what's the best we can hope for? And for those of us who are outside government, NGOs, educational institutions, what can we do to help shore up the situation since these great prescriptions are not likely to move forward in the way we would, we would otherwise hope? How can we help fill the gap to improve this relationship? Well, uh, I answered the last question with my policy prescription, uh, 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 but um, I uh, approach this subject uh, on the basis of optimism about what new American administrations can do because um, George H.W. Bush, as Eastern Europe was vibrating, essentially changed the U.S. approach to Europe that had been embedded in policy for uh, the period after the, since the uh, end of the Second World War. So he decided to do that. There was a great deal of criticism on the part of many. So presidents have an enormous amount of power in our system. Uh, one of the prescriptions is they have to work with the Congress, and maybe that seems unimaginable now. Uh, I agree, uh, Malia, with your uh, judgment that a Trump second term will not do most or perhaps any of these, but certainly most of them. But if that's the case, the uh, world will inherit with four more years of this an immeasurably worse situation than now. And then the question of will his successor be able to manage that situation that they will have to uh, encounter uh, their first day in office. So, um, uh, but on the fundamental question, uh, Gordy Howe Speaking of Canadians, Gordy Howe once said, I never s scored a goal having not taken a shot. <laughs> so that's what the next administration does. And this is just, of course, a basis of a discussion. And no administration will say, 22, President, Get Blackwell in here and those 20, no. But a basis of discussion based on the premise, on Leonardo's premise that we have to do in order to try to arrest this deterioration because it, so much is at stake for ordinary Americans beginning with the health of the American economy. What do we think it's going to happen to the American economy if we have a permanent confrontation with China. What do we think is going to happen to the American economy? So I, I don't want, George Schultz once uh, uh, said uh, in a meeting, I'm tired of hearing what we can't do. Does anybody have an idea of what we can do? And Henry Kissinger talked about the State Department's inclination of preemptive capitulation. <laughs> so no, we must do. That is a perfect note to end on. We are out of or slightly over time, which is not National Committee tradition. But you can see why Ambassador Blackwell has the most downloaded <laughs> video, because it's such an interesting thing to talk to listen to. Thank you so much.